last time we were discussing basic principles that are used in computer security. And I shall continue to extend that list with just a few more items. And then we move on to do other things. So another thing to do is to keep an eye on your infrastructure or your system. Surveillance is about that. Typically, uh, you've seen this in stores where there's a webcam or just a camera that records events. And what are the benefits that we get once we set up such a system. We can monitor lots of things while out of the place. Okay, so you, you have remote observation, yeah? What else? You can prepare for attacks. You can prepare for attacks. Uh huh. So if someone breaks a perimeter, you know that you have to beef up your security. Mm -hmm. So you can anticipate certain things. Does remote observation include includes motion detection? Yeah. I do not specifically refer to video surveillance. It could be a radar showing you a dot when a plane enters your airspace. It could be a, a death star in the orbit of a planet waiting for a spaceship to, to enter the galaxy and, and stuff like that. Uh, do you think there are any drawbacks or disadvantages or downsides of surveillance? Has anyone ever tried to find a specific event on a video recording that was 20 days long? Oh yeah, and it depends on the DVR and how old it is. It could take forever yeah. just to rewind. The thing is that with certain data, you can press Control F and look for things. With other types of data, uh, it might not be an option. So you should remember that gathering data is really easy, but analyzing data is a much bigger problem. You might rely on machine learning algorithms, or you could delegate this to a number of people who manually process every sequence in the video or who manually read every page of a non-digital document, etc. cetera. Um, anything else you think we should add to surveillance? In the context of computers, you could uh, look at the headers of each packet that gets into your network and use some decision based, uh, some, some set of rules to decide whether a packet has to be dropped, forwarded, or copied somewhere. Uh, you may have heard about a system referred to as PRISM, developed by the NSA, which effectively uh, kept a copy of every incoming and outgoing packet and it's a, it's a system that would attach to the backbone providers in several key areas on the North American continent. So basically they could see all the traffic in that area. And if they really wanted to, they could scroll it, well, they could scroll it back, they couldn't scroll forward to go into the future, but 
they could collect the data and then if they wanted to, they could begin to look for correlations or patterns in it. A choke point is another simple concept that relates to, well, I could give you an example. Uh, if you remember, there was a super well-known famous historical battle where a very small number of Greeks uh, kicked the collective ass of a very large number of non-Greeks. Who, who were they? Persians. Okay, so the, uh, they were greater in number. They probably had a lot of hardware. Nevertheless, the Greeks used something that allowed them to, to defeat the enemy. Uh, how did they do this? They led them for a narrow path in which case the enemy couldn't surround them, so they had to go in a few at a time. Yeah, so the throughput of Persians per second yeah. was limited per square meter in this little passage. So if you have a system this big, all of its, uh, its boundary is a place where the enemy can attack you. But if somehow you can transform the environment in such a way that the enemy can only come from one direction, then you could really concentrate on this side because you know the enemy has no choice. Um, just remember that you have to be really careful when you make assumptions about uh, where the enemy will come from. And you probably know about another thing that happened in history, which is the Maginot line. Does it ring any bells? Okay, it rings bells to you. Could you explain this to your colleagues? It was in France. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember the uh, French, they built uh, uh, some barricades uh, to protect themselves by invasion of the, of the Germans. The Germans. The Germans. <laughs> <laughs> so if this little uh, rectangle is France, they built a very heavy reinforced line somewhere here where they expected the Germans would come from. And they had tanks, sharks with lasers on their heads, automatically detecting targets and hitting them, etc. And the Germans came from here and from there. So now let's try and transpose that into the context of computers. What's the choke point in the security system? Ports? Yeah, so I guess like the fact that only a number of ports out of the multiples could be open so that mm -hmm. you know every attack that's going to come in is going to come into those particular ports. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about computer networks, yeah. if somebody wants to establish a connection, they have to connect to a given port. And you can expose all of your ports, or you can expose just one. How can we expose just one port? So, okay, so let's imagine that this is our system. And we have multiple services. One of them is a web interface for the managers. Um, this is another interface for the admin who can set up uh, updates on the server. And then we have another port number. Let's say it's an FTP server so people could upload files. So now we have three lines. Each of them is an attack vector as you learned yesterday. Now, somehow, we have to transform it into just this single line and have all our biggest guns pointed in this direction. So if the enemy comes from that way and they cannot 
on a computer network, if there is just one open port, they cannot connect to another one. So how can we make that happen? things. Okay, so this is one option. What's another option? I, I showed you how to do this in the previous semester sometime when I was connecting to a machine at work. I was using an SSH tunnel. So what this means is that there's only one listening uh, application, which is my SSH. And the managers, the admin, the FTP server, you can all access them once you establish an SSH connection to the machine. And then you can tunnel to other ports uh, or other machines in the same network. You could also use a VPN, a virtual private network, to which, uh, which one can connect to. And then from that point on, they can access things that are inside that VPN. So this would be an example of a choke point. Uh, if we had to secure a building, for example, a bank, what would the choke point be? Or now let me ask you another thing. Did anyone ever go into a library in a foreign university? A library. I know it's very uncommon for us to go to a library, but uh, did you notice anything specific in the architecture of that building where you went? Centralized. Centralized? Okay, so it's a cylinder. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, how many entrances were there? in that building? Huh? Just one. Just one. Well, did you see that or do you ask me about it? Well, it often is the case that even though the building is huge and they have multiple doors, they are usually locked. And if you are on the inside, there is a label at this door that says open it only in emergency cases and the alarm will ring if you open it. So you have only one option, that is to go through the main entrance, which has a system, and every book has a thing in its cover. Usually it's an RFID tag. So when you go through this choke point, a system picks up the RFID tag, and if it looks it up in the database and it's recorded as a book that's not officially assigned to anyone, then obviously someone is trying to, to smuggle this book through the choke point. So an alarm rings and someone kicks your ass. Uh, you usually see the same thing in stores. Uh, for example, um, uh, Terra Nova, somewhere on uh, Stefan Chelnade and Ismail, like this. Did you notice that all the items have a little thingy attached to them? And if you try to walk out with this thing is still attached to the item, an alarm will ring and a security person will ask you a couple of questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's your favorite color? <laughs> and uh, what's your favorite music genre? So you see other examples of choke points. It's a very simple principle and people apply it all the time. And another one, which is really important is the need to know. You may also hear people referring to it as NTK or N2K. Uh, does it ring any bells to anyone? Okay. Have you seen the film Meet the Parents? There is another one after that. I forgot its name, but where one of the characters turns out to be an, an ex-CIA 
officer. And he was telling you things about the circle of trust. You could be either inside or outside. So this is something really similar to that. Um, if you watch the news, or if you watch films about uh, secret organizations and spies and terrorists, what usually happens when one of the bad guys gets caught? Uh, well, they are indeed in a better mood, yes. What else? They try to get some information out of this person. Where is everybody else? What's your password? What's your favorite color? Of course, <laughs> it's, uh, it's the first question in, in, the rule, in the rule set. And uh, they sometimes apply torture because torture is a very effective mechanism of uh, obtaining information. It is illegal these days where people follow the law. But people who break the law, they usually don't care about whether something is legal or not. So uh, what else do they do? When they try to get this information out, sometimes the person is weak and they give away the truth. And that's when the good guys win. But what could be done by the bad guys to ensure that nothing the good guys can do will give them that information? Special deals. Special deals? Special pills. Ah, special pills. OK, cyanide capsules, yeah. standard equipment, <laughs> indeed. Uh, what else? To deceive them, maybe, to think that that is the bad guy when he actually is an ordinary citizen. So give them false information. Okay. Yeah. But let's say, let's just hypothetically assume there is a lie detector, which really works. And they use this lie detector to see that the person is not telling the truth. Mm -hmm. So what else? Don't tell everybody everything. Exactly. So if, if this is all the information there is to know about our organization, uh, this information can be shared with a number of people. So all of this is known to, to all of these agents. Now, if you catch one of them, they can potentially reveal this whole set to everybody else. But if you divide this information in such a way that one person only knows a subset, then you can torture them for as long as you want. But in principle, by definition, there is nothing you can get out of them. The worst thing that happens is that whoever tortures this uh, unfortunate person will kill them, get some fake information, whatever, but they won't know the rest of the info. So that's need to know. And. Uh, can you tell me, or can you think about examples that illustrate how the need to know principle is used in computer security? Well, how does that tie, let's say, in an organization, different users have different passwords to the system, so each one has a different set of privileges. Mm -hmm. So an administrator would have way more privileges than a simple user. Mm -hmm. So special users have more options, yeah. restricted users have less options. Um, okay, that's a good example. Let's take a, a typical POSIX system where you have your home directory. Let's say we have a user whose name is Algernon. And this is their home directory. Can Algernon get out of this home directory and read, let's say, Charlie's files? Hopefully not. Well, by default, this is indeed the case. Unless this person 
deliberately changes the permission to a file or directory, allowing other users to do something with it, read or write. But unless you do that, uh, this person is limited to their own little environment. Um, let's think about need to know and, and physical security. Could you give me some examples of that? Pietro. So not one single person can launch a nuke. Yeah. We need more people yeah. to do that. And if you catch one of them, you can't force them, nor can you get out the secret that will. Mm -hmm. This makes sense. Another example you could take into account is access to a building. So as a student who just walked into the university, I could walk around the halls. I could get myself uh, a sneakers bar from this uh, evil machine on the first floor. And I could even walk in, inside this room, I mean walk into this room. But I couldn't get into the dean's office and open his safe and get everybody's grades and make arbitrary changes in it, even if I really wanted to. Um, in a smaller company, uh, you usually give uh, the keys to personnel who are supposed to come and uh, sweep the floors and you know, remove the dust. You give them the keys to enter in, into the building, but you don't tell them the password for your root account, for self-destructing the building, etc. You only give them as little information as they need to know to get their job done. So, the need to know uh, is about minimizing the knowledge that you share with a person to the extent that they need to get their job done according to the requirements. So, do you have any questions about this? Anything? Well, in that case, I shall switch to the next item in our agenda. Well, I wrote down primitives, but I remembered one more thing. And uh, DIY stands for do it yourself. And Usually, if you ask people about basic rules of security, they will say the first rule of security is don't do it yourself. Uh, however, I must point out that usually you narrow this down not to security in general, but to cryptography. And the reason I would like to emphasize this is because there were already uh, two occurrences of people rolling out their own scheme. So somebody suggested that they wanted to invent their own encryption cipher, which is an interesting initiative, but there are some um, tricks you have to keep in mind. And another thing that happened uh, yesterday is that somebody rolled out their slightly modified hashing approach, which is again another thing I encourage. And here's why. Uh, in order to develop a cryptographic algorithm, you have to be really good at several things. One of them is mathematics. Well, you need to know about technology, and you also need to have a lot of experience 
to be able to invent something that somebody else cannot easily break. And usually this experience is not something that one person has in their brain. Usually it's collective knowledge. Um, the ciphers that are typically used in the programs we rely on on a daily basis, uh, for example, web servers that use HTTPS to encrypt your connection to a web server, uh, they rely on algorithms that were standardized. And each of, that, each of those standards were established after long, complicated procedures that were established in order to ensure that people don't end up relying on crypto that is not to be trusted. For example, uh, there is one institution, NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, they are from the US. And this institution is responsible for um, defining which algorithms become standards that are then employed by the US government for internal use. And they standardize things such as hash functions, encryption algorithms, and so on. Each time they choose to make a new standard, uh, they set up a competition. with a series of requirements, such as the cipher shall be this fast. It must support key lengths of that many bits, blah, 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 and so on. And then teams and people from all over the planet uh, create something that they believe matches these requirements. So there are multiple submissions from different countries, not just from the US. This is submitted to the committee. Then they have a long process of reading, analyzing, uh, trying to break the cipher. And then they have usually multiple rounds. After the first round of the competition, they weed out certain participants who really sucked. And for some participants, they say, well, yeah, it's pretty not bad, but we discovered that if you do this and that, then it becomes weaker. So think about it and do something about it. And in the next round, you get to update, then submit it again, and it's reviewed again. And it's not reviewed by just one person or two people. It's an entire community. So it is this collective brain of humanity that gives us the experience necessary to state that you know this cipher that we just analyzed is a reliable one, so let's use it for the next n years. Another problem is that even though you chose to implement a standard, a standardized algorithm, your implementation can be buggy. At some point, you could uh, leak memory, or you may uh, implement it in such a way that if you give it specifically crafted input, it will not work properly. And this only becomes clear to someone who has the right experience to poke the mechanism and look for its weaknesses. So let's say we have a not very competent person who implemented their own version of a cipher. This not very competent person tried the code and it worked as they expected. So to the best of the knowledge of this not very competent person, this code is flawless. But then when a very competent person looks at the same code, they see that, well, you know, it's not that secure 
as they thought. And this very competent person could either be um, you know, a noble uh, and fair and benevolent competent person. So they contact uh, the vendor and they tell them, I found a vulnerability in your implementation, you should fix it. Or they could write it to a mailing list that addresses these issues so the whole world can be aware of it and do something about it. What they can also do is they can keep this information to themselves and exploit it as they see fit to gain more money, uh, to destroy some critical infrastructure in an enemy's country, like break a bridge, uh, poison the water filtering system, many bad things can happen. So that's why you should really rely on standards when it comes to uh, cryptography and security in general. If you think that inventing your own algorithm is a good idea, it most likely is not a good idea. Unless you are one of these people and there are other people who can say, yeah, this person really knows what they're doing. Um, what NIST also does is they certify implementations of uh, given algorithms. Usually this works as follows. They generate a bunch of test vectors which are nothing but predetermined inputs, which if they are fed into your implementation, at the output you shall get some pretty fine value. So the test vectors are generated for each implementation specifically, and if you pass these test vectors, I mean, if these test vectors give you the expected output, you could say, yeah, it's right. And what NIST does is they generate test vectors for you, they run the tests, they can sometimes give you some recommendations, and this is a very expensive process too, uh, if you want to be NIST certified. So it is probably a good thing to mention that it is in the best practices to rely on existing libraries that implement cryptographic primitives. So you could use that thing which was tested by time by a community of very competent people instead of rolling out your own mechanism. So don't do it yourself. Another implication of this rule is that throughout our practical assignments I won't tell you to implement this cipher or that cipher. We will focus on using existing implementations of given algorithms and combining them in order to implement some high-level functionality. This skill will be more valuable to you. That's one thing. And second, I really suck at mathematics. So I don't feel that I'm the right person to teach others how to properly implement ciphers, how to test them, how to invent their own ciphers, etc. So unless you have questions, we can switch to this section in which we discuss cryptographic primitives. Uh, one of them was already mentioned in our practical assignments and it's about cryptographic hashes. I normally explain it in some key points myself, but since you were already exposed to this info, I will ask you to help me uh, define a few key criteria for a hashing function. Stefan. Criteria for a hashing function? Yeah, what is it? What defines it? What does it do? Yeah. 
uh, hashes uh, are used to make a signature of a file for some information. To make a what of signature? Signature. Okay, I will write down the word signature, but I am not eager to move this keyword there because you have to first define what a signature is. A signature is something that proves that a document was signed by me, so it's authentic. Is this what you mean by signature? No, uh, I mean it's a fingerprint of the information. Uh, a fingerprint. Well, I will write the word fingerprint. And Some of the things you need is a function that generates a code, mm -hmm. that generates the signature of the impact. So. Okay. It sounds close. Uh, so, the hashing function takes input of arbitrary length. What does it give me at the output? It gives you uh, a number, uh, not a number, but uh, a set of values that uh, depend on the values in the number of bits, mm -hmm. which is uh, represents the same. Mm -hmm. What's the relationship between the size of the input and the size of the output? Uh, it doesn't, uh, I mean, uh, the, out, the size of the output is irrelevant from the size of the input. So the size of the input may be one, one, uh, one uh, digit or a set of values, it will always be the same length. Uh, okay, so it, ha it has a fixed length output. What else? What other properties does a hashing function possess? It's one direction. So it's a one-way function. And this means that, uh, so if this is a hashing function, I gave it x at the input, and it gave me, well, let me use something shorter. and it gave me y at the output, there is no way I can obtain x from y, but I can always obtain y from x. Do you agree? Yes. Mm -hmm. What else? What if I give it an x that is very close to a previous input, but has a difference of one bit. Okay, so it's very sensitive to variations in the input. Very sensitive to changes in input. And basically that means that if if the input, if uh, the output, well, if the hash of ABC is that, then the hash of, let's make it a capital A, BC will be something completely different in this uh, Not notation. It should be different from the original hash. Yeah, it should be different, and the design of a function is to actually be as different as it could possibly be. Um, what else is there to know about a hashing function? Collision is possible. Okay, so we have to be aware of collisions. What is a collision? Um, so, two different inputs 
can give us the same output. Even though um, well, there's something else we should have mentioned, is that it tries to give us a unique output for every possible input. But given that the hash of some data has a finite length, obviously there will be, in an infinite universe, there will be more than one input that gives you a given output. So that's when you get a collision, when two different strings give you the same hash. Uh, you have to keep in mind, though, that even though it is theoretically possible to produce a collision, actually producing a collision is not easy. And whoever designs a hashing function is perfectly aware of that. Our mission is never to make a hashing function that, by design, excludes collisions. This is not going to work. Our mission is to make a function for which it is very, 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 very difficult to produce a collision. Yeah? Why? Why? Because this is a fundamental property that we expect this function to give us. Why because do we, why do we expect our hashing function to have a very low probability of giving us a collision? Because that's what we want from it. Now let me explain. Um, did you ever see a hashing function in the universe? Yeah. Like if you look through the window, did you see any hashing functions outside? Probably all of the adjective system. <laughs> <laughs> well, it usually gives you the same output for, well, it, Variation in output is very small. So the thing is that a hashing function is an artificial thing humanity made up because we wanted it for certain purposes which we thought, well, we could actually use it. So that's why it has it, because that's the way we want it. Does my answer make sense? No. Okay, let me try another one. Uh, why would one want to have even a, I don't know, uh, percent probability, uh, chance to have a collision, why would we want this? Why would people who invented hashing functions want this? Okay. It doesn't make sense. Hold on. Uh, Victor has something to add? Yes. Uh, I want to maybe uh, get some sense uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, to answer the question. Uh, in a way. Let's try. So uh, if you find some collisions, for example, uh, you have three words which map to the same hash. And now, to a dictionary attack, uh, you don't check all those three words, you just check one of them. So now you have a smaller amount of uh, attacks to make in order to find what, what do you need. Uh, does it make sense? Because, for example, duck, dollar, and monkey map to the same hash. So if I put my uh, password duck, then if someone writes dollar, then it will be the same password. So it will be hashed to the same output. So yeah, so that means that uh, because of the fact that passwords are the same to the same text, that means that somebody with, while you have the password that, could look into your account with the password dollar. Is that mm -hmm. all right? Yeah. Oh. No, <laughs> that's not all right, but his thought process Sounds reasonable. Okay, let's see what he has to add. Okay, wait a second. Somebody. That's a problem with the collision. That's why a. No, no, no. He also doesn't understand what was. The question I want to ask why would our initial plan be to make a function that has less collisions? Why not remove collisions at all? Ah, okay, but I got it. The problem with that is it's impossible to remove collisions. Because. What another thing we want from it is to have a fixed length output. So you can have 
a function that gives you a fixed length output, but works for any kind of inputs. In other words, you can't eat the cake and have it too. You either have it, you either eat it. You can have it and eat it, but you can't eat it and still have it. Unless our digestive system gives you a hash of the cake. <laughs> so is it clear? Is there anything else we should uh, address? So we, we wanted a function to give us fixed length outputs. And this is one constraint, and on, on, the same hand, on the other hand, we wanted to also give us unique outputs. Obviously, this is not possible because the length of the output is finite and is fixed. But we can at least make it very, very difficult to find two different inputs that give us the same output. Can you give me examples of hashing algorithms? So there is SHA1, SHA2, not that long ago. There's MD5, well, there's also MD4. Uh, what do these letters mean? MD stands for Message Digest. It's uh, a name NIST came up with. At some point, uh, researchers came up with theoretical methods that reduced the effort necessary to produce a collision. So people over there thought, hmm, we need to do something about it. So they set up another competition with a new set of constraints and requirements. And that's how SHA came to be. This stands for Secure Hashing Algorithm. Currently, it's at version 3. Um, another primitive is a randomizer. And there are several things that have to be emphasized. So first of all, what you're normally dealing with is not really random data, it's pseudo-random data. Why is that? Could somebody make an educated guess? Well, if the, ran the, randomizer, if the randomizer is created by a computer, mm -hmm. then it can't be completely random because computers follow some rules. Yeah, even as a human, can't really say it's a completely random number and choose one. Okay, uh, let's make a small test. Think of a random number, write it down, and in 20 seconds, let's see which numbers you've written down. Quiet. Quietly. <laughs> okay, I think you have... What are the ranges? Any random number, that's all I told you. Okay, I, I hope you're done. Did anyone think of seven? One person. One, two people. No, I thought 47. 47. Did anyone say 13? No, no one said 13. <laughs> so, what was your number? 23. You wrote it down? <laughs> How do I know it's really the number you thought of? Seven. Maybe you thought of 13. And then just to mess with me, you said, no, 23. So 7, 23, what else? 47. 47. 8. 8. 8. 1. 1. Wait, 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 wait. Five, four, one, two, one, seven, eight. Seven, eight, five, three, ah, six, nine. Okay, so it's a long number. I suppose no one else thought of it. But that was its purpose. Nine, two, one, two, seven, six. 
Nine two one two seven six. You? Five. Uh, person in the back? Or you were not a present in this class? Thirteen? <laughs> well, you just made it up, right? Okay, Yulian. Five, six, one, six, three. Okay, and you guys? Four million something, something, something. Four million? I, I really need the number. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Not that fast. Four, one, four, eight. Four, one. Four, eight. Three, nine, six. Three, nine, six. Forty-nine. Forty-nine. Put in? It was seven. Ah, seven. Well, I noticed that most of the numbers you generated are prime numbers. Are they? <laughs> this seven multiplied by seven is 49, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so. Yeah. It's two prime numbers. 23 isn't prime? It's prime. Seven, one, five. And maybe this one, too. <laughs> we could try to factor it. Um, two people said eight, and two people said seven. If this dot, well. Okay, so we did have some random numbers. Thank you for thinking about them. We have at least one match in this small group of people. Um, when I ask this question, I usually get prime numbers that, and I think the reason this happens is because people tend to give me hard numbers. And when I say hard, I mean numbers that don't add up nicely with a zero in the end or at least a five. So I wasn't surprised about this line. Now, my next question is, how did you come up with those numbers? Well, when it comes to a number like mine, and I'm assuming a number like Victor's, the idea of random was to get a number that says unique as possible. Mm -hmm. So there would be no collision to the other number. So then picking a big enough number to give you a bigger probability of it not being with another person. Okay. So there was quite a kind of, even though you, you say it's random. Another thing that I usually notice is that nobody ever says zero. Nobody gives me negative numbers. So if we rerun this experiment in such a way that uh, before I ask the question, I first write down some numbers and then we collect the data and then we compare how many of my numbers, so which of my predictions really turned out to be true. And you will see that uh, knowing that there will be no negative numbers or no zero, I can narrow down the range where I should look. It's difficult for a person, of course, to predict such fantastic numbers like four million something something or five something else. But when it comes to security and computers, small, um, if there is a slightly greater chance for me to correctly predict your numbers, then this gives me an edge over you. And uh, we might cover that in the future. So uh, several things need to be pointed out. So first of all, the numbers computers give us are usually pseudo-random numbers because they did not come from a source of randomness. They were generated by a deterministic algorithm that was 
it was invented by someone, it was implemented by someone in code, so it was following some guidelines. So imagine that this is your randomizer. You give it some inputs, like what's the weather, what time it is, how bright the light is, how much CO2 there is in this room, what's the noise level, etc. It does some magic and it gives you a random number at the output. Well, if I knew the value of this input, the value of that input, and so on, I could predict the output of this randomizer, and that can be a really bad thing. I will, uh, we will then both go through an exercise where predicting a random number uh, makes you win a game, so to say. So, what do you think computers use as a source of randomness? Time, time stamps. Time stamps. Mm -hmm. What else? So it, if it relies just on time, before running this piece of software, I can go to the system settings, change the current time, so I can influence the output of this randomizer. So maybe time plays a role, but not the only role. What else? Fragments of a processor or something? Fragments of a processor? Yeah, Frequency. Mm -hmm. As long as the frequency varies even by one unit, I mean, it's going to give different results. Okay, have you ever... So if you use the CPU frequency, we can say it varies in a pretty narrow interval. Let's just imagine that there is a 5 gigahertz CPU. It cannot be zero. No. So it's just this really narrow interval out of minus infinity to infinity. It might be the current. Huh? It might, might be the current uh, frequency. The, uh, uh -huh. the you mean electrical current? Okay. Or which frequency were you referring to? Mm -hmm. CPU load. Yeah, CPU load, etc. So. Um, the point is to, to rely on things that come from the environment, not just the stuff that is in the software. Because I might be able to control the time my machine thinks is the current time. I might control the CPU frequency, but I cannot control the weather or the speed of the wind. Or if you look at this nice tree, I cannot control how the leaves will move when the breeze hits them or uh, when photons are reflected by the leaf, etc. It's too unfortunate that you cannot film this beautiful tree because of this. But we all know it's there. Now, there is another thing you need to know about randomizers, that every randomizer has a property known as a period, which can be explained as follows. Um, if you initialize a randomizer with a given seed, A seed is, let's say, a sum of all the inputs transformed in one way or another. So if you initialize the randomizer with, the, with a given seed, and each time you, you, you ask it, give me another number, give me another number, and it gives you random numbers, perfectly random numbers. I almost said perfectly random numbers. Mm -hmm. So it gives you random numbers, and at some point, you reach a state, when you say, give me a random number, it begins giving you the same numbers in the exact same order again. 
So that's uh, a period. The longer it is, the better. Now, it is really valuable to know what the period of a randomizer used by your target is, because uh, you could do things such as, let's say this randomizer gives us 100 numbers, and then it begins repeating them. So I patiently ask it for random numbers, I, I write them down in a list, and when I notice that it begins giving me the same numbers, I say, aha, uh -huh, I've exhausted your creativity, and now you cannot be, you won't be giving me anything except what you have already given me. So with this list, I can predict what the next random number will be, which is a really important thing to be able to do. Another concept you need to keep in mind is that of entropy. Entropy is a measure of randomness. You probably heard about it uh, in your physics course, when you studied gases, or when you read about the, the fate of the universe, that entropy increases. So entropy is randomness. If you have something that is that possesses a high entropy, it means it's disordered. And if it's low entropy, it means it's ordered. And if it's ordered, it means it can have patterns in it. If it's a pattern, it means there is something that repeats itself. If it repeats itself, it's predictable, so that's bad. Now, uh, what can we use as a source of entropy? You gave me some ideas the time, uh, the temperature. Some programs, you may have noticed, that um, some programs ask you to move the mouse on the screen chaotically, and they collect the coordinates to which the mouse goes, and they use that as one of the inputs for the randomizer. Yeah, I think TrueCrypt did that but they are by far not the only program that does that. Um, so, there is a term, P, something where determinism isn't anymore, because you cannot know for sure which state a particle is in when you are dealing with things at the quantum scale. So very, very small particles behave in a way that cannot be predicted. That's bleeding edge science for now. Uh, but until quantum computers become the norm, we'll have to be using that. There is another term you might be, uh, you might bump into, which is a CS, P R N G, and it stands for cryptographically secure pseudo random number generator. This is a mechanism that gives us pseudo random data that is suitable for use in cryptographic applications. Uh, let me mention other things you will find useful. So if at some point in your program you need to get some random data, the worst thing you can do is give the user a prompt and ask them, give me some random numbers so I could use this to secure your system. That's not the way to go about it. Um, on a POSIX system, you have a, a virtual device. Called dev random. Which is a, it behaves like a file. If you read some bytes from it, it will give you random bytes. 
If you read 20 bytes from dev random, it will give you 20 random bytes, and so on. Uh, has anyone tried that? And did you see any patterns? Did it really give you random data? Well, you think it did. We know it gave you pseudo-random data. What you might also know is that there is another file called dev u random. Did anyone try that? Okay, so no, not unsigned. U stands for unblocking. So this one blocks. This one is non-blocking. And blocking in the sense that you have already dealt with when you learned about the BSD sockets API. Uh, the, um, well, certain functions can be blocking, meaning that if you call that function, it's not going to return control to, your, to the rest of the program until that function is done. So it blocks until someone connected or until someone sent you one byte of data. But if it's non-blocking, then it will return right away as much data as it had. And if it didn't get any data, it will just throw an exception saying something. Now, since it is really important to, to have properly randomized data for your cryptographic purposes, if you use dev random, it will, let's say I need 50 random bytes for some purpose. The operating system keeps, let's call it a pool of random data, which it keeps um, refreshing by taking into account those inputs. So which IP address is connected to me, which port numbers were allocated, how long until this uh, TCP segment reached me, etc. So there are a lot of timers, a lot of variables in the state of an operating system. All of that stuff is distilled into this pool of random data. And let's say it has the size of 100 kilobytes of highly entropic data. So when one program says, give me 50 random bytes, it takes 50 bytes from here. Then another program says, give me 100 random bytes. It takes 100 bytes from here. Some program can request 50 kilobytes, you know, in, in greater amounts. So at some point, all this pool is depleted. And when that is the case, if you read from dev random, it will block until the OS is able to populate this with new random data where the level of entropy is high enough for that thing to be cryptographically secure. So it will block until it knows for sure it can give you high quality data. Whereas dev u random, won't. It won't block. If it, well, what it normally does is it takes data from this pool, but when it's depleted, it will still give you something which isn't that uh, entropic anymore, but it's better than nothing. So you have to keep this in mind. On other platforms, for example, on Windows, you have a thing known as the crypto API, which is a set of primitives that do a bunch of things. One of those functions in this API gives you random bytes. Uh, is it clear? Does it make sense?
Another primitive that is widely used is, a, is an encryption algorithm. You can also call it a cipher. Uh, I will erase this. How long until this class is over? Zero. Zero minutes. Well, in that case. When you started the sentence, it was only zero and zero. Uh huh. Okay. So we stop here and we resume next time. <laughs>